Hello and welcome to White Fight, a conference on politics and ideology in militaries and armed groups, brought to you by the Center for War Studies of University College Dublin. I am Yanis Korsalakis, the lead organizer of this event, and the Marie Curie Fellow here at UCD. The purpose of this conference is to consider the ways in which particular sets of political ideas, values, or mentalities have shaped military practice over the 20th century. The talks you're about to watch have been pre-recorded by our participants and will remain available here in history. There are 12 papers in total organized in four thematic panels. Our speakers examine a broad range of topics from naval officers in the Russian Civil War to the use of paramilitaries by the Rhodesian government during Zimbabwe's War of Liberation. Professors Pierre Asselin and Junke Nigel will deliver keynote talks that will be recorded on the day of the conference and also made available in history. Our first panel examines the self-perception of soldiers and officers. Militaries are among the most secluded of communities. Their members are expected to adhere to certain sets of values that do not apply to the civilian population. Our papers in this session will examine how serving soldiers themselves have understood their place within the political communities that they defend. Our first speaker in this session is Jenna Byers, an end stage PhD candidate at King's College London. In this paper, Jenna looks into the battle for historical narratives taking place within the army of the First Austrian Republic. After the collapse of the Austro Hungarian Empire in 1918, the Austrian Republic emerged as a new independent state without an existing national identity. So, how did the Republic look upon its Habsburg past? And how were Austrian soldiers expected to relate to their imperial military heritage? Jenna considers these questions in the following talk. When discussing interwar Austria, there are a few things that everyone knows. First, interwar Austria was quite small. Second, interwar Austria wanted nothing more than a union with Germany because they were all Nazis. And third, interwar Austria wanted nothing more than a union with Germany because they were all Germans. I am here to change your mind about some of these things because only one of them is actually true. Interwar Austria was indeed quite small. Meanwhile, the identity which the government of Austria attempted to produce was, as we shall see, neither particularly German nor specifically Nazi, rather they attempted to create what I have dubbed a Habsburg Austrian identity. In 1918, at the close of the First World War, Austria was the leftover territory of a once vast empire, struggling to make its way in a drastically remodeled Europe. A whole host of new states had risen out of the ashes of the empire, taking with them most of the raw materials and manufacturing capacity that had existed in Austria-Hungary. The bit left over was the administrative part, with a bunch of civil servants in Vienna and a rural community that was angry about the war, angry about the peace, and angry about pretty much everything the government was doing. While there continued to be anger and frustration across Austria throughout the interwar period, the tone of this anger and its direction would evolve significantly over the years. The government that came to power in 1918 was run by the left-leaning Social Democratic Party. They inherited an economically weakened, territorially reduced, generally exhausted country that had been losing a war for several years. Unsurprisingly, they looked at their neighbours, at the nation of Germany, and what they saw was a country that was economically stronger and which was bound to recover faster. They sought an economic union with Germany to help their own recovery and their reinvention as a small nation state. They were denied this by the Allies, who also issued a list of decrees about material with military applications that Austria was obliged to destroy as part of the peace deal. The very same committee that oversaw this destruction also proposed a loan to Austria so that they could buy new civilian versions of a lot of the things that the committee had told them to destroy. But that is a different story for a different day. 20 years after all of this, in March 1938, Hitler and his merry band of fascists marched into Austria, where they were greeted by flags, music, and cheering crowds. These people also appeared to want a union with Germany because, as historians have so wisely argued, they were all Nazis who considered themselves German. There are a few historians who have wondered whether all of the Nazis in Austria actually wanted a full takeover, or whether they just wanted to overthrow the legally elected government and install a Nazi regime of their own, but that is the subject of a different conference paper, which you guys missed, so now you'll just have to wait and see. So if the left-leaning socialist government wanted a union with Germany in 1918, and the right-wing populist movement, which didn't actually hold government office or government power in 1938, also wanted union with Germany, the obvious conclusion is that everyone in Austria wanted a union with Germany 
all the time and there is nothing to discuss here, right? Obviously not. In fact, the transition that happened during these 20 years is exactly what we're here to discuss today. Because after the socialist government fell in 1920, they were replaced by the Christian socials who, as you can tell from their name, were a centre-right, generally well-meaning party. And the Christian socials began to consider what it really meant to be citizens of the newly created First Republic of Austria. They did not believe that they were natural citizens of the German state next door. True, both countries spoke German, and yes, they both called themselves German, though many modern Austrians will inform you that they in fact speak better German than the Germans. Better being an interesting term that we don't have time to discuss fully today. But it is this concept of betterness that is key to understanding interwar Austrian identity, because the government developed an idea whereby Austrians, as the direct descendants of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and specifically of the Habsburg family, could, in fact, trace their lineage all the way back to the first arrival of the Romans in the Danube region. The peoples in this region then evolved through to a certain point wherein a split developed between two different German tribes, which would eventually turn into the Germans who lived in the nation state of Germany, and the Austrian Germans who lived in what would eventually become Austria. The Austrian government then chose to distinguish this new identity that they were creating from that of the German nation state by highlighting their connection to the Habsburgs as the family which demonstrated the best of Germanness in recent times. There's that concept of better and best again. Hence, I would argue that the Austrian German identity, which they put forward in the late 1920s was a Habsburg focused identity. The government used various methods to disseminate this identity and this connection with their Habsburg past to the population. But the key element that we are looking at today is education in both civilian and military spheres. You might be surprised to learn that the Austrian government saw a strong link between civilian education for children and the armed forces, going so far as to teach the ABCs with A is for Apfel, B is for Baal, C, so on, all the way down to S is for Soldat or Soldier. Because apparently a nation that could recruit a maximum of 30,000 troops like to start them off yet. Though this, of course, makes sense because under the Habsburgs, the military was a highly respected, prestigious institution. Many nobles served in the armed forces, including my personal favorite, Franz Josef, who made public appearances almost exclusively in military uniform. The Austrian cavalry, for much of its history, was considered to be one of the finest in the world, a legacy which lives on in the Spanish riding school in the Hofburg. Don't be fooled. There are some historians out there who will try to tell you that the Austro-Hungarian army was the laughing stock of Europe, but they won more battles than they lost, and crucially for our conversation today, they were widely respected by the common people of the empire. Of course, after the First World War, with hungry, desperate soldiers looting and pillaging, this reputation did take significant damage. But the Christian social government devoted a lot of time to repairing that damage and rehabilitating the military's image. Their first step was to revamp and reopen the Military History Museum so that they could educate their citizens about the military and about the role of soldiers in the war. They included statues of many of the heroes of the Thirty Years' War and the Napoleonic Wars, conflicts which, which both involved confrontations between Austria-Hungary and Prussia. And if a government is willing to teach its citizens about historic conflict with another country, it doesn't immediately suggest to me that they're desperate for an alliance with that country now. They also included a series of pictures which can be translated to shot effects, where they attempted to explain to civilians what the experience of war was really like. A valiant effort at the best of times, this demonstrated the time and energy which the government was willing to devote to improving the reputation of the armed forces and restoring the relationship that civilians and soldiers had shared under the Habsburgs. They devoted this time and effort largely because the soldier was an ideal figure to represent the key features of a Habsburg German. He was almost overwhelmingly Catholic, and if he wasn't, as the good soldier Zweck tells us, he was happy to pretend that he was Catholic. In the predominantly Catholic nation of Austria, this was not a difficult goal to achieve. To highlight the importance of religion and faith in particular in the Catholic Church was not a difficult thing. The Habsburg German soldier was also an upstanding citizen, eager to assist in times of crisis. The military was frequently deployed in disaster relief operations after floods or avalanches in the interwar period, so much so that one newspaper calculated that in 1927 alone, the military provided more than 50,000 hours of disaster relief. This went a long way to improving relations between the military and the civilian population and engendering trust between them. But crucially for the government, which did not have the steadiest grip on power in this period, the Habsburg Austrian soldier, like his Habsburg imperial predecessor, 
was apolitical. Keep in mind, this was a tumultuous period in European politics. Robert Gerwitz has argued that the First World War didn't end until 1921. There were communist uprisings in Bavaria and Hungary immediately after the war. And the rise of fascism meant that no government on either the left or the right was entirely safe from extremist dissatisfaction. Therefore, having a reliable military that could be trusted to defend the constitution of the state was a particularly important element of retaining power. As the Austrian government learned when they suffered a left-wing uprising in February in 1934 and an attempted Nazi coup in July of the same year. So with all of this in mind, we should not be particularly surprised that the government tried to instill confidence in their leadership among both soldiers and civilians by suggesting a connection between themselves and the Habsburgs. If they were the natural successors of the previous iteration of leadership, then they no doubt assumed it would be easier to retain power. This Habsburg connection was emphasized as early as primary school. At the age of nine, students were being taught history, beginning in the Middle Ages with Rudolf von Habsburg and carrying on from there. They were raised to believe that their nation, the small newly formed Republic of Austria, was inheritor to the grand legacy of the Austro-Hungarian Empire with all the prestige and self-respect that such a legacy entailed. This effort was then refined over the years from 1927, so that by 1934, the Department of Education was producing textbooks to be used not just in civilian schools, but also in the military training academies. Some of these books were deemed so valuable that the army administration decreed that every garrison library in the country had to have a copy of them. And we're going to discuss two of those texts from 1934 now. Oh, do mein Österreich, uh, oh, you my Austria, if you like, and Unser Vaterland in Wandel der Zeiten, Our Fatherland in Changing Times. Mein Österreich um, is an example of a text that refutes the notion that the interwar Austrian government felt any particular desire for a union with Germany. There is a little, what I would describe as children's history of the country included in the book, going as far back as Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian I in the 1500s, suggesting that the Austrian legacy didn't just extend through the Austro-Hungarian Empire, but went back even further than that. The book contains a story about Emperor Maximilian, who was out hunting one day near Innsbruck when he followed a deer into a mountain pass, and when he eventually emerged, he found that he was trapped on a ledge high up on a cliff with no safe way down. When the people of Innsbruck saw this, they were horrified, but a good angel came to Maximilian and guided him on a safe route back to the ground. This sweet, though probably untrue, story highlights two elements that had become key to Habsburg Austrian identity by the 1930s. First off is the obvious point that Maximilian's legend is described as part of the Austrian mythos and one of the collection of folk tales that all nations generate about their past. Secondly, this story emphasizes the Christian nature of the Habsburgs and by extension, the Austrian population in contrast to the Islamic East. This becomes relevant later in the book during discussion of resistance to Turkish sieges and various conflicts, which we don't have room to go into here. Once this potted history has been told, most of the book is then devoted, devoted to a flight over Austria, which goes from Bergenland in the east to Salzburg in the west, describing the beautiful countryside, the fine cities and the wonderful people that they flew over on their way. Aside from the obviously propagandistic nature of this section of the book, particularly relevant to our discussion today, is the segment surrounding Salzburg, which, as I'm sure most of you know, is right on the border between Austria and Germany. It is also particularly close to Berchtesgaden, where the head of the newly Nazi German state spent a great deal of his time. If we return to the assumptions made earlier, that about everyone in Austria in this period being a Nazi who wished that they were German, then we would be fairly safe in assuming that this section of the book offers a golden opportunity to discuss the land and the leader lying just over the border. It would be a natural segue into a fantasy about what lay on the other side of that boundary line and what could be if only there was a formal union between these two states, which were basically the same. Except that didn't happen. Rather, the text discusses the beauty of Salzburg and its mountain location, the heartiness of the people who lived there, and in fact, does not mention Berchtesgaden, Germany, or the Nazi leadership in any way. The book reiterates time and again that the borders of Austria, as they were in the interwar period, were the correct borders. That though the empire had shrunk, these were the logical borders for the republic that had grown out of that empire. Military training further backed this theory up in an interesting model called Heimatkunde, or homeland studies. The test questions for this module in the year 1935 reveal questions discussing the borders of Austria as natural 
as though they were always meant to be. Only three years before the German invasion occurred, I cannot say that this sounds to me like a government or an army particularly interested in sublimation into the German Reich. But perhaps I am mistaken. Let's look at our other book, Unser Vaterland im Wandel der Zeiten, Our Fatherland in Changing Times. It's an interesting title, I think you'll agree, suggesting that at the very least, the Austrian government was aware of the political turmoil around them and the upheaval that was racking Europe at this time. This awareness further supports the theory that, in fact, the Austrian government was perfectly conscious of German activity across the border, but that they deliberately chose not to engage with it because they were not themselves interested in becoming an extension of the Nazi Reich. But what about the content of Unser Vaterland? This book covers similar ground to that discussed in Mein Österreich, but it also goes further back. The author, Wilhelm Scheer, attempts to draw a direct line of descent from contemporary Austria all the way back to the Babenberg family, which predates the Habsburgs. He describes in considerable detail a story from the Crusades, when Leopold V, or Leopold von Babenberg, fought alongside King Richard of England, bringing Austrian continuity all the way back to the 13th century now. This story describes a conflict in which Leopold fought so ferociously that whoever approached him, he conquered. No one defied him. By the end of the fight, he was so covered in blood that his entire tunic had turned red, until he removed his belt, whereupon a strip of white was revealed across his middle, an image which bears a remarkable similarity to the red and white flag which the interwar Austrian government had selected to represent their country. Scheer argued that the creation of this symbol was what inspired Leopold to change the symbol of his house from a red eagle to a white stripe on a red background, both to mirror the image that he had inadvertently created and to honor the heroic dead who had fallen in the fighting. This story again suggests some of the key points that have been raised in this paper. It suggests that the Austrian government did not see German history as something important to themselves, but rather their focus was on forefathers who could be argued to have Austrian lineage, primarily through the Habsburgs, but also through the Babenbergs who preceded them. It also shows the keen propagandistic eye of the Austrian government in this period, as they were using a very old story to make the flag of a very new country appear to carry the weight of history behind it. A symbol from the 13th century had been handed down to them through the years, making the Austrian Republic the keeper of all the history in between, again, without reference to any German connection. And finally, the story, particularly the way it is recounted in Unser Vaterland, demonstrates the government effort to use soldiers as representatives of the Habsburg Austrian identity they had created. Scheer stated that Leopold V began to use the red and white symbol to commemorate the dead, much as red and white flags were used to commemorate soldiers who had fallen in the war and those who died fighting against the political coups which also occurred in this year of 1934. The story reminded children that they should respect the soldiers throughout history who had died for them and their republic. Overall, the argument I am making is a simple one that the government of Austria made efforts in the interwar period to create and disseminate a unique Austrian identity that was different to the German identity. By extension, this difference meant that while some citizens within the Austrian Republic might have supported an economic union or a takeover by Germany, this was not necessarily true of every citizen. Over the years, our description of interwar Austria has simplified to such an extent that we describe a nation in the throes of self-creation as a politically stagnant backwater with little or no desire for agency in its own right. The Austrian German citizen or the Habsburg Austrian, which the government attempted to create, was one who was strongly led by his Catholic faith and who was inspired by the ancient houses that had ruled over these lands for hundreds of years to defend and honor these lands. He was encouraged to think in martial terms of defense and to tie the creation of the new state into the much longer legacy of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Holy Roman Empire that had preceded it. This effort on the part of the government was hampered by a number of factors, a severe reduction in prestige and the shock of adjusting to their role as a small nation, the crippling demands of the First World War peace treaties, the economic collapse of 1929, and the growing radicalism across Europe in the 1930s, which infected Spain, Germany, and Italy, among others. When the German invasion came, the government decreed that there would be no military resistance, not necessarily because they were overjoyed at their reunion with their German brethren, but because the Chancellor could not bear the thought of one drop of good blood shed in pursuit of a fight they evidently could not win. 
Hitler sent 65,000 advanced troops into a nation whose entire army was capped at 30,000 men. Resistance would have meant death and annihilation. But this did not mean that the military in particular did not mourn the passing of their nation. On the day of the German invasion, a group of high-ranking military officers and their grandchildren marched to St. Stephen's Cathedral, carrying the flags of their regiments to be stored in the church for safekeeping. They refused to let German hands sully the regimental flags that represented their long history, in the same way that soldiers on battlefields had fought for centuries before them to keep their flags out of the hands of conquering foes. These men were not Germans, and they were certainly not Nazis. They were Habsburgs, and they would have been honoured to be referred to as Austrians.